recording. You may go ahead and start the meeting. Okay, good evening. We'd like to welcome you to the March 9, 20, it's March 11th, <laughs> isn't it? Am I right? Yes, March 11th. Okay, good evening. We'd like to welcome you to the March 11, 2021 special called meeting of the Board of Dwelling Standards and Review. Pursuant to the Governor's Executive Order 71, this meeting is being conducted electronically. This meeting is being recorded and will be available to the public via the city's YouTube page accessible at Johnson City TN dot org backslash meetings no later than two business days from the date of the meeting the time is now 604 present and con constituting a quorum are board members dave jenny gwen hunter jennifer hyder johnna robbins and i'm the chairman jenny Lockmiller. when the property you wish to speak about is announced please indicate your presence by raising your hand after being recognized by the chairman, each person wishing to speak should come forward to the microphone and state their name and address before making any comments. Please keep in mind that these hearings are recorded, so if you refer to a document or photograph, please describe it. Also, please speak up and speak clearly, stating yes or no to questions that may be asked. You also have the right to have your attorney present during the hearing, though the strict rules of evidence that are found in a court do not necessarily apply here. After entry of an order by the board, you will have 60 days to appeal the order in Chancery Court if you should choose to do so. Does anyone have any questions? All persons having intentions to speak, well, I, I probably will need to swear people in individually as they speak. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, so we'll go ahead and do this now. And then as each person speaks, I'll swear them in again. Um, all persons having intentions to speak before the board on any property, please prepare to be sworn in. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I do so solemnly swear and affirm. So solemnly swear and affirm. Hang on one second. Oh. Hang on one second, please. Um, uh, Mr. Gutschow, Gutschow, can you please unmute? So we do need to go ahead and um, uh, swear in staff and the architect. Uh, okay. None of the attorneys will be sworn in. Okay. Um, Richard, are you testifying or are you providing background? Whatever you choose for me to do. Well, I mean, do you have evidence or do you have information that would be considered evidence for the board tonight? Do you have new information since January 28th of this year? I don't think so. Okay, so if if you were called upon, then we can just do you individually. But for now, we'll do staff and the architect. And then when you open the public hearing, mm -hmm. when you open the public hearing, it's then that you will need to do them one at a time. Okay, okay. So we'll go ahead and do this one for staff and the architect. Uh, if you'll raise your right hand and repeat after me, I do so solemnly swear and affirm. I do so solemnly swear and affirm. That the testimony that I'm about to give is the truth. As a testimony, testimony about the, truth. About the, truth. the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. the truth. Thank you. Each board member and staff have been provided a copy of the minutes of the February 25th, 2021 meeting. Are there any questions, amendments, or corrections in regard to the meeting, to the minutes? Not hearing any, the minutes will stand approved as written. The first item of business will be 123 West Millard Street. At the January 28, 2021 meeting, this board determined that the property located at 123 West Millard Street is unfit for human habitation and that the condition of the structure is unsafe per Johnson City Code 13-304. Today, we're gonna, we will conduct a public hearing for consideration of an order to vacate the property based upon the board's previous findings and order. Since the only item on our agenda is the public hearing for the residents of 123 West Millard Street, no determination made tonight will affect the existing findings regarding the condition of the structure. Those findings shall remain in full force and effect. It is a further note that this board only addresses building code violations. 
If any fire code violations continue to exist, those will be addressed separately through mun municipal court outside the sports jurisdiction. Tonight, the board will engage in a two-prong fact-finding process. In the first prong, evidence will be presented regarding the structure by city staff and an expert engaged in the Haven of Mercy, engaged by the Haven of Mercy, who's licensed to provide professional architectural services in the state of Tennessee to determine the current condition of the property located at 123 West Millard Street. Documentation was provided by the Haven of Mercy to this board on February 25th, 2021, during the last BDRSR meeting of the engagement letter of the architect that will work with the Haven of Mercy. The engagement letter was dated February 25th, 2021. A further note in the board's records regarding this property, evidence was presented at the January 28, 2021 meeting that the documentation was provided to the Haven of Mercy in September, 2020, regarding the need to engage an architect at that time. Any testimony to be presented by the architect will be new evidence for this board's consideration, as the services of the architect have only been available for approximately two weeks. This background is provided for the benefit of all parties as to why this board will consider testimony from an architect at this time. The second prong of evidence to be presented shall be from the occupant's residence of 123 West Millard Street, who will be given the opportunity to provide testimony regarding whether undue hardships and irreparable harm would be caused by the literal interpretation of chapters two through five of the Johnson City Code Title 13 if the board were to issue an order to vacate. And I'll turn it over to city staff. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Chairwoman Locke Miller, Vice Chairwoman Hunter. I will share my screen. All right, this does concern the Haven of Mercy at 123 West Millard Street. A code enforcement officer assigned to this case was Lorena Bennett. Just a recap of the, uh, which you've alluded to in your, in your opening, Chairwoman Locke Miller. Uh, here is a recap uh, of the BDSR's previous orders on, and the summary of events of each BDSR meeting. The BDS, the 10-22-20 show cause hearing, the investigation slows basis for a public hearing. On 1-28-21, the BDSR at the, at the public hearing, uh, which the Haven of Mercy attorney participated in that public hearing, the board determined the structure unfit for human habitation due to conditions which include defects that de increase the hazards of fire, accident or other calamities and disrepair, vacate and close the board ordered the structure vacated and closed as a place of human occupation or use and the continuance to the petition to the 225-21 BDSR meeting with the owner of properties and interest present to provide an update on progress. At the 225-21 um, meeting, um, the BDSR rescinded the order to vacate and close the structure as a place of human occupation or use and ordered a public hearing, a special called meeting on March 11th, which we're now attending tonight with the occupants or parties in interest to present evidence of immediate or irreparable harm caused by a temporary relocation while others, other orders by the board are brought into compliance. To date, no stamp plans have been submitted and the city has not received any permit applications. Um, the Haven of Mercy did provide a list of all residents that occupied the building as of 2 10 21. Uh, to properly notify each one of those individuals of this special called hearing, a notice of public hearing sent by certified mail to each individual listed on that list that was provided by the Haven of Mercy. All but one letter sent to the occupants were refused. Um, per the Tennessee Rules of Evidence Rule, Section 40411, when service or of a summons process or notice is provided for or permitted by registered or certified mail under the laws of Tennessee and the addressee or the addressee's agent refuses to accept delivery and it is so stated in the return receipt of the United States Postal Service, the written return receipt if returned and filed and the action shall be deemed an actual and valid service of the summons process or notice. Service by mail is complete upon mailing. That brings us to where we are today. 
Um, again, no permits have been pulled, uh, no stamp drawings have been received. Uh, we are here for, uh, to answer any questions that you may have of us. Um, there is no further evidence that city staff needs to present at this time. And uh, as you probably saw while we're swearing in, uh, Chief Building Official Jeff Cannon is in my office if you have questions for, uh, for him. David McClellan, Development Services Manager from the building, uh, and, and uh, can speak on behalf of the building division as well. And um, Chairwoman, if you'd like me to stop sharing the screen or um, I, will, I will do so, or I can leave this uh, timeline up if you'd like. Uh, let's actually stop sharing screen. And at this point, I think it's uh, appropriate to open the public hearing unless city staff has any other information they would like to share. City staff has no further information <laughs> they'd like to share at this time. Okay, at this point, we're opening the public hearing. Is there anyone who would like to speak? Um, I would. Um, I'm Amber Lee. Um, I'm a city resident. I live at 723 West Pine Street. I'm legal counsel for Haven of Mercy Ministries and Mr. Rodney Walter, who is a resident of Haven of Mercy. Um, I have a, a presentation that I have made. I'm gonna share my screen as well. All right. We're not seeing your screen. Not yet. Okay. All right. Let's try something else. Can you see any of that? I can't. You can't. Um, have you allowed sh screen sharing within the hearing? Let's check with yes. Nicole. Yes, we have. Okay. You, you should be receiving, if, if you weren't, you should be receiving a display that says no permission to share screen. Are you seeing that? I'm not. Okay. So one of the things that gets a little, if you've got multiple screens, uh, Miss Lee, or if yes. you've got multiple pages open, when you click the green share screen, make sure you're picking, because you, you, you should see multiple options. Pick the exact, exact screen, the exact thing you want to share. Sometimes that can get tricky if you've got multiple pages open. What application are you using? PowerPoint? I'm using slides, Google Slides. Okay. Can you go at the bottom of your screen and hit share screen? And then click the screen where your slides are on, and then there'll be a blue button on the right that says share. There it goes. Okay. All right. Excellent. Thank you for the help. We appreciate that. All right. I get the present mode. All right. Can everybody see that better? Okay. Yeah. I'm seeing some nodding of heads. All right. So part of the responsibilities of this board is to determine whether the dwellings are fit for human habitation, but also require specific remedial measures that are necessary for dwellings that are designated as unfit. And I want to talk about specifically the petition procedure. And this is in 13302. This is kind of why we're back here again today. Um, the relevant portions that I wanted to talk about are right here, and it includes 
what the public board must, must do, excuse me, um, includes some magic language. And so part of that language includes that there has to be a notice provided, there has to be specifics about what the issues are um, for the property. It has to show where and when a hearing will be, that there will be a hearing. And then it has to include language that says that um, you have the opportunity to file an answer, to appear in person, to give testimony, and that the rules of evidence don't necessarily apply at this hearing. So lawyers, we call that magic language, things that a petition must include. So the board must conduct a preliminary investigation and serve a complaint stating these specific things, what the specific charges are, that there'll be a hearing before the board, a fixed place and time, and that the owner and the parties of interest have the right to file an answer to the complaint, to appear in person and to give testimony at the hearing. Now, not only the owner, but parties in interest and the municipal code defines parties in interest as occupants. So that's why we're here tonight is that the owner and the occupants have the opportunity to do that. The statement, there also has to be a statement included in that petition <clears throat> that says that the formal rules of evidence are not required at a hearing before the board. All right, this is part of legal notice that legal notice officially notifies an owner and the interested party specifically what is wrong with the property. It has to include that magic language that we talked about that is in city ordinance 13302. The notice has to provide details about the alleged code violations that make the building unfit. Um, both the owner and the occupants have to receive the legal notice. The legal notice has to be perfected by personal service or by certified mail. So personal service is process server or by certified mail. Simply telling somebody something or some, telling someone that there's a hearing does not perfect service on that individual. And I think there had been some confusion by the board last time about Mr. Rockley's responsibility to, to notify. These issues are not technicalities. They're not, um, these are part of a fundamental due process right. The board has to provide these specific components in the legal notice before you deprive an owner of the use of their property or the occupants access to their home. So the- Excuse me, Ms. Lee, may I ask yes. a question? Yes. Has that, has that situation been remedied? Have all the owner's occupants occupants been served appropriately now? No. Um, the occupants have, the owner has not. Okay. So um, the first notice that came to the owner was dated July 22nd. And it was in the form of a letter. It said that there were permits required uh, pursuant to 12-103. Um, it specifically said that permits were needed for a kitchen hood, an electrical panel, and an exterior outlet and switch. Um, that also said that the requested stamp drawings for the kitchen hood and the electrical issues, and then the city requested that extension cords be removed. And so that part about the extension cords being removed is in the second part of this. Now, there were four other codes cited, care of premises, building codes in general, mechanical appliances, responsibility, mechanical and electrical. There were no specific violations cited. Um, I asked um, the development services director uh, via email, if he could provide a specific list because the notice doesn't provide specifics on what the violations would be for care premises, building codes, these, these four points. And I was told that via email that, that it couldn't be a list provided. I also talked to city attorney, Ms. Sandoz and asked her 
if a list could be provided. And she said that the board is not considering those um, when it considers whether a premises is habitable when unfit. Now, I differ in that legal assessment. If the notice says care of premises, building codes, mechanical appliances, there needs to be some specifics. Um, and and the, if there are, then that would be before the board. If there's no list of violations whatsoever for these four, then it wouldn't be something that the board could consider. Also, you might notice this, this notice doesn't include that magic language we talked about, the, the specific things that it has to include. And I reference that because this is the same notice that has been sent each time. And so each time it's not had that specific magic language. Now, this matter became before this board for the first time in October. A notice was mailed October 7th, stating that the board would meet the same day on October 7th. Um, the board actually did not meet on that day, made a, met on a different day. So this was the first time this property was on this board's agenda and no one received notice of this show cause hearing properly. Um, this notice didn't go to occupants and it actually got sent certified mail and the certified mail notice states that it was received on the 14th by Mr. Rockley. This hearing in October, the show cause, um, the, and obviously we can acknowledge that noticing somebody for a hearing the same night or providing the wrong hearing night is an issue. Um, the board met in October and that was the board's preliminary hearing. Um, also notice that this notice sent out in October 7th doesn't have that magic language either. Portions of it are available, but not all of it. All right, so we get to our January 28th meeting. And I understand that there had been communication about what needed to be done, but not specifics, but in a broader scheme of what could be done between that October meeting and the January meeting. And my understanding is that the board didn't have a regular meeting in November or December. So at the October 28th meeting, the owner had had heart surgery two days prior to that and his legal counsel requested a continuance, but the board did not grant that continuance. So he was not able to provide testimony that night. Um, at that hearing, as the board, you all heard lots and lots of evidence. Now, much of the evidence that you heard was outside the scope of what was before this board. It was also, you heard evidence that was outside of what the board could even consider. So things that weren't on the notice and then things that this board would never consider even if they had been properly noticed. Now the board made findings based on that evidence that was outside of the scope of what the board could consider. Neither the owner nor the occupants of the building received no, any notice that the board would consider vacating and closing the building on the 28th. No one received notice with the required magic language of due process rights. Okay, so the owner and at least one of the residents um, needed a remedy. So based on the legal issues that I've pointed out today, um, the Haven of Mercy and an occupant brought forth legal action. Um, in February, on February 19th, the Chancery Court restrained this board from closing the Haven of Mercy or, presenting, or preventing the, the residents from occupying the building. So at the February 25th, 2021 hearing, this board rescinded its prior order to vacate and close the building. And in response and in good faith, the Haven of Mercy voluntarily dismissed its case against the board, but without prejudice. However, we're here again tonight at this specially called meeting and the agenda is whether to try to vacate and close the Haven of Mercy again. Um, and of course, what we are here on and we would 
again state if we end up in the same position that the process, the procedural issues have not been addressed. But what is before the board tonight is a complaint about unpermitted electrical, electrical issues, improper ventilation and extension cords. So um, we are prepared to present testimony of what a hardship it will be and also why this course of action and vacating and closing the property is just not necessary. So this is our official notice to the board that we are filing a hardship appeal. Um, the Haven of Mercy Ministries is housed at 123 West Miller. So it's not just a residence, it's a ministry. The building is over hundred years old and over the years work has been conducted without city issued permits. Uh, the owner has acknowledged that and has worked to remedy that. Uh, to resolve the issues, the ministry has engaged the expertise of Carl Gutschow with Thompson and Litton, a general contractor, GTL Incorporated, electrical engineer, um, Trimble Company Incorporated for doors and Newman's Heating and Air. Um, at the February 25th, 2021 hearing, this board received physical evidence from each of the professionals that I've just mentioned that they had been retained to work on the structure. We provided those letters for this board to show that they had been hired. Just because it was dated the date of the, the meeting doesn't mean they were hired that day. The architect is here tonight and he can testify that he has in fact been engaged and has been uh, what his work has been thus far. And he also is going to testify that this work can be completed while the occupants reside in the building. This board's actions will also cause a hardship on the owner. They operate a religious ministry out of building, the building. The owner must have a reasonable timeline to provide stamp drawings, have professionals pull permits and make repairs. The owner has commenced the stamp drawing process. However, given lack of specifics in the violations, the drawing permitting and repair process may take longer. And this is without, this is not because he hasn't asked. The repairs that co cost a significant amount of money and they will take time to complete. The repairs can be made while the ministry continues to operate and the occupants continue to reside in their home. This board stated that unpermitted electrical work is not a hanging offense. And prior board minutes have reflected that when an owner has engaged an architect and is working with the building department, the structures are typically removed from the board's agenda. This also provides a hardship on the occupants. The Haven of Mercy can serve up to 70 residents at their downtown location on Millard Street. There is no other facility within the city limits that provides these same resources. The Haven provides transitional and permanent housing, nutritious meals, job skills training, medication assistance, hot showers, counseling, and spiritual guidance. The Haven also provides holiday meals to thousands of homeless, those facing homelessness and shut-ins. They deliver meals to the John Severe Center and local jails. They provide toys and toiletries for the community. Residents do not come and go each day. This is not like the Salvation Army where someone has to leave each day at 6 a.m. The folks that are, live at the Haven live there. They can and do reside there long-term and house their belongings there as well. Repairs can be made while the occupants continue to reside in their home. Something that we have to consider is the Tennessee Religious Freedom Restoration Act. The Tennessee Religious Freedom Restoration Act provides that If you're going to substantially burden a person's free exercise of their religion, the government has to show that they not only have a compelling government interest, but also that it's the least restrictive means to furthering that compelling government interest. Vacating and closing- Excuse me, Ms. Yes. Lee? Yes. Could we, I'm, I'm sorry, our public hearing at this point is set aside to determine how specifically um, individuals who reside at the Haven of Mercy 
will be irreparably harmed by a potential vacate and close order. Um, I'm afraid that these things that you're pointing out at this point are not relevant to that specific uh, requirement. Okay, well, I would disagree that um, vacating and closing the Haven of Mercy is not the least restrictive means of furthering this board's interest. All right, does anybody have any questions? Okay, um, we have uh, Carl Gutschow uh, to present testimony. Also, Mr. Rodney Walter, Kevin Kirsten, and Bill Wade who reside at Haven of Mercy. Thank you, let's start with uh, Mr. Gutschow, the architect, please. We, we commenced our uh, survey of the building uh, uh, Wednesday of this week to start pre preparation of drawings as, you, as the building department has requested. We are doing as what we call as-built surveys to verify the dimensions and the nature of the building and locate all the doors and openings and windows so that we can prepare an accurate set of drawings. We are simultaneously identifying the life safety features that are in the building that we will, that we will enter on our life safety drawings. And as we complete those drawings, we will also identify the items that have been requested to be repaired that we've noticed in some of the uh, information that has been provided to me through uh, Grant Rockley from from the city. So we are simultaneously looking at what repairs would need to be made to address the concerns uh, that the board has with the facility and the uh, code enforcement division has with the facility. So, but we have started work and we are bringing our electrical and mechanical engineers online as well to address the electrical mechanical. But the basics are the architect has to start with a set of clean as built drawings and that is the process we are going through right now we started the measurements on Wednesday and we are placing all the information that we gathered into our CAD drawings so that we can produce the drawings of both the existing three story building basement and the annex area. So Mr. Gutschow, so are you able at this point to identify the work that needs to be completed? No, not yet. So still, at this point, you are unable then to also provide an expert opinion as to whether the work can be completed while occupants are in the structure. Just based on information I have right now, yes, but we have to continue looking into our what work needs to be done. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you have anything I'd else like you'd like to add? Just we just need time to prepare the drawings. Are any questions from the board? Yes. Uh, Mr. Gustav, I just want to be sure I really understand your answer to Ms. Lockmiller's previous question. Um, I understood you to say that at this point, you don't have enough information to state clearly whether um, the building, it would be safe while you're doing the work or not. Is that? That's correct. Is that correct? Okay. Thank you. Um, other question, uh, just you know, your best, you know, what kind of an estimate might you be able to give us as to how much time it might take you to um, complete the drawings to get to the point where you could put uh, projects out for bid? Right now, we're going to need, we're going to need at least a couple of weeks, 30, 30 days between now and a month. Okay, thank you. That's all. Any other board members have questions for Mr. Gustav? Okay, um, I think uh, Ms. Lawrence then, I think we have some other people in who would like to speak as part of the public hearing. If you'd like to let the next person in, please. There's no one in the waiting room at this time. And this is Devin Muse. Would I have an opportunity uh, to pose a question or two to Mr. Gutschow? Yes, that would be okay. 
Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gutschow, did I understand your prior testimony being that you all, you haven't been able to independently assess what needs to be fixed in the haven of mercy? And because of that, you can't, it makes any determination from your independent consideration difficult here or unfeasible? Until we, until we complete our survey of the building and, and complete our measurements and details, I cannot say for sure what work would be required to make the repairs. Understandable. Now, have you reviewed the board's um, statements of the alleged code violations and what does need to be repaired from their perspective and review? No, I've, all, I've, all I've had so far is the uh, fire code department information. Okay. Well, I have the uh, provisions here and I'd like to ask you a couple questions about them. So in terms of a kitchen hood that needs a suppression system that may potentially vent into a closet, does that present an imminent and life-threatening danger uh, to the occupants if that was to be the state of affairs there? The existing hood, are you talking about a hood venting into a closet? A hood venting into a storage closet. That is not good. Would that present uh, an imminent danger if it was in operation? Yes. Okay. And if that hood was removed uh, and taken offline and the kitchen was no longer in operation, would that still present an imminent and immediate danger to the occupant? No. Does, does not having a permit for electrical mechanical work in and of itself present an immediate and danger to the occupants of the building? Not having a permit, but no work is in progress? As in the fact of not having a permit, does that itself, just because a business or an entity does not have a permit, does that itself present an imminent and immediate danger to the occupant? No. Does, and at least one more question, does, does not having electrical stamped drawings, well, let me ask you this, electrical stamped drawings, uh, mechanical stamped drawings, those are part of the permit process. Was that a question? That sounded like a statement. I'm sorry. Getting drawings, is that is it correct that that's a part of the permit process? Getting the stamp drawings are part of the permit process. Okay. And so it would also be your opinion that not having those drawings or any other aspect in regards to securing the permit does not present an imminent risk of danger, life-threatening danger to the occupants in and of itself. Correct. All right, that, I have no question, no further questions. Thank you. Chairwoman Locke Miller, I have questions for Mr. Gutchow. Um, actually, public hearings are not for statements, are not really for questioning of the uh, architect by actually, the attorneys. Actually, are they? Uh, the uh, legal counsel has the authority to cross examine. Okay. Um, they, um, I know that's a little, this is a little weird and different, um, but they can cross-examine during the uh, QJ hearing. Okay. Yes, then uh, you may cross-examine. Okay. Well, Mr. Gutchow is my client's witness that we called. So I just wanted to clarify some things with you before the board. Um, to put in a commercial hood, 
Is that something that could be done while residents live in the facility? Yes. Okay. To um, check the unpermitted electrical work, is that something that can be done while the residents live in the facility? Yes. To check the, um, the electrical panel, which would be included in that, that would also be something that they could do while, that could be done while residents lived in the facility? Yes. Okay. And then also removing extension cords. Is that something that can be done while the residents still live in the facility? Yes. Okay. I have no further questions. Thanks. Is there anyone else who would like to speak during the public hearing? Yes, we have occupants of 123 uh, West Millard Street uh, who are here to speak today. Okay, uh, if, sure. Um, I will need to swear them in as they speak. So if they will step forward and um, state their name and address, and then I will swear them in. Absolutely. And uh, if it's okay, I'm going to, they'll be on my screen and I'll be to the right of them uh, during that time. Okay. Uh, first uh, is Mr. Grant Walter. Or I'm, I apologize, Scott Walter. Okay, Mr. Walter, if you will state your name and address, please. Scott Walter, <coughs> 123 West Miller Street. Okay, Mr. Walter, I'm going to go ahead and have to swear you in. So if you'll repeat after me, I do so solemnly swear and affirm. I do so solemnly swear and affirm that the testimony that I'm about to give is the truth. That the testimony I'm about to give is the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing. But the truth. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Walter. Now, please describe how an order to vacate and close the property at 123 West Millard Street will cause you irreparable harm or undue hardship. Well, I've lived there for 11 years. 11 plus years and uh, it's just going to be uprooting me out of my home i mean it's 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 not a temp that, that this is my home and i also work at i also uh, work for the haven i'm the director of the haven and and uh you know i've got i've accumulated some things over the years and and uh you know with uh i don't, I don't really want to go at this point into a into a building with a you know just a bed because that's not what I've got right now do any board members have questions for Mr. Walter yes I do um Mr. Walter if if um housing if a, a separate housing was available to you during the temporary time that you had to be relocated, would, would that alleviate some of the irreparable harm? I know it would be very inconvenient, but we are considering the safety of the structure. So would that, talk to us, would that cause you irreparable harm? Well, I don't, I don't see any, everything that they've, that they've got on the list, I've seen the, the list of things that need to be done can be done with us living in the building. I don't see any reason to uproot all the guys that, that live there to, uh, you know, to do the repairs. I mean, it, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, why, why do it? Why, why, why throw everybody out of their home? Well, I, I do understand, sir, that we have a difference of perspective right now, and it certainly is not the desire of anyone on this board to have to do that, but we do have to consider all the factors. So that's why I'm asking you if a temporary relocation would would be devastating to you. Yes, it would. In what ways? In what ways? I've, I've still got a I've still got things that I have to do, and the stress involved in it. I mean, you know, think about it. If you if you were taking you know have to move from your home for uh, an undetermined amount of time, and uh, move all your move all your stuff, or or leave it there, and then you know, it, I mean, okay. that, that's it's pretty obvious that it's gonna that's gonna cause a whole lot of stress and a whole lot of 
And I mean, you know, everybody that everybody that lives at the Haven is broken in some way or another. Right. You know what I mean? Yes. Sir. And putting them putting them through, through unnecessary stress is is just you know it's it's not good for that condition. Okay. You know what I mean? Thank you. I I, I appreciate I appreciate your your can candid being candid about that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Walter, do you have anything else to add? Ms. Lockmiller, I have a question for Mr. Walters. Sure. Now, Mr. Walters, um, this is Amber Lee here. Um, if the Haven of Mercy was closed, you would not only be losing your home, but you would also be losing your job. Is that not correct? Yes. And that would also cause you irreparable harm? Yes, ma'am. I have nothing further. And I have one question for Mr. Uh, a question or two for Mr. Walters. This is Devin News. We're on the same screen. Mr. Walters, if the Haven of Mercy violated your rights in the process of removing you from your home, is that something that you think could be fixed with money or would that be something that can ever be fixed? Or in other words, would it be irreparable harm? It would be irreparable harm. No further questions for Mr. Walters. Mr. Walters, do you have anything else to add? Not that I can think of on, on the spot, no. Okay. Mr. Mews, uh, do you have other people there with you? Yes, that is correct, ma'am. Could you tell me how many you have there with you? I have two more individuals uh, from 123 West Miller. Okay, thank you. If the next person could come forward and state their name and address. Yes, I'm now calling uh, occupant Bill Wade. And Mr. Wade, spell his last name, please. Yes, Mr. Wade, could, uh, could you state your name, spell your last name, please, and your address? My last name is spelled W-A-D-E. I live at 123 West Miller Street in Johnson City. Okay, and if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and have to swear you in. If you'll repeat after me, I do so solemnly swear and affirm. I do so solemnly swear and affirm. That the testimony that I'm about to give is the truth. That the testimony I'm about to give is the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you, Mr. Wade. Will you please describe how an order to vacate and close the property at 123 West Millard Street will cause you irreparable harm or an undue hardship? Absolutely. I came out of rehab almost a year ago and went to the Haven of Mercy. I'm an alcoholic and being there has allowed me to be in a structured environment that allows me to maintain sobriety. If I've drank, I've drank myself to almost to death and I, I've been sober so long, but the despair of being put back out on the street, it would be the end of my life. I, I can't tell if Mr. Muse's screen has frozen or, okay, now it's back. <laughs> um, okay, I'm sorry. I think we, we lost you for just a second. Okay. Um, that's it. If the Haven of Mercy closes, I got out of Magnolia Ridge. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, it's the structured environment that I needed. And to be you know, the move, I mean, the despair alone would cause me to drink. And I've drank myself almost to death. I have liver damage. If I maintain my sobriety, I can live. But I mean, the despair, I, you know, and I, I won't be blaming it on anyone, but I need the structured environment that the Haven provides. And without it, I'm probably doomed. Do any of the board members have questions for Mr. Wade? I have a question for Mr. McLean.
Yes, are there, are there, um, I know that um, Johnson City Housing Authority had made uh, efforts to provide facilities and um, housing for Haven and Mercy residents. Are there any options available in sober living type facilities or a facility that would provide the structure that Mr. Wade would need? Um, are there groups available to provide those services to him? Yes. Uh, what are those groups and what sort of arrangements have been made? Uh, during the tem temporary closure and relocation of the occupants there, um, a number of folks went to Manor House, which specializes in uh, rehab, rehab type services for substance abuse. And they have a very good track record of uh, providing services and a great success for doing so. And it, and it works somewhat like the Haven of Mercy where they provide housing, long-term housing and monitoring and various therapy services. And, and uh, they have, have people there that have been there for quite a while and they provide monitoring and oversight and uh, they monitor to make sure they take any prescriptions or medications that are required. So those facilities and services are available in, in many of the folks. And, and I don't know if Mr. Wade was one of the people that went over there, but several did go there and it was a new facility. It was very clean and it was, it was a very, very nice place. Very nice. Thank you. They charge rent. I'm unable to work full time. I can barely, I'm able to stay at the Haven by simply doing some chores there. Uh, these other places, they would require me to get a job because I'm not on disability. Uh, these places charge you to live there and the Haven does not do that because I have no money. Do any other board members have questions for Mr. Wade? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Wade. Mr. Muse, if you'll bring your third resident, please. Yes, Ms. Lockmiller. And if I may, I would like to submit a formal objection to this board's consideration of Mr. McLean's prior statements in hearings on the ver uh, for this very property, this board has denied any testimony or, or putting forth of facts about other agencies and their abilities, unless one of those agents and representative of those agencies is present. So unless Mr. McLean works for the Manor House and those other agents, I would object to that. Additionally, I would object to any of his basis for being able to determine since he's not a representative of those entities, how many persons from the Haven have or have not joined their facilities and what, what efforts or, or services that those facilities provide. And that's something that I've watched this board keep out from consideration of itself in one of the prior two hearings. And so I would make that request uh, well, objection and, re and request at this time as well. Uh, but I am ready to bring forth the next occupant. Uh, so stated. Mr. Muse, if you'll bring your next um, resident forward, please. Uh, Kevin Kirsten. Uh, Chairwoman Lockmiller, while that gentleman's coming to the, to the seat here, um, uh, understood Mr. Muse's comment. Um, Mr. McLean did not voluntary that inform or did not volunteer that information. It was not voluntary. You had simply asked him a question. Yes, I did. Okay, Mr. Kirsten, if you'll state your name and spell, actually, if you'll spell your name for us, that would be helpful. And then uh, state your address. My name is Kevin Kirsten, K E V I N, K E R S T I E N S. And I, my address is 123 West Millard Avenue, Johnson City, Tennessee, 37604. Thank you, Mr. Is it Kirstein? Am I pronouncing it correctly? Kirstein. I'm Kirstein. sorry. 
Kirstein. Okay. I'm Locke Miller, so I get mispronounced a lot. So I understand. <laughs> um, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and swear you in. Sure. Uh, so if you'll repeat after me, I do so solemnly swear and affirm. I do so solemnly swear and affirm. That the testimony that I'm about to give is the truth. The testimony I'm about to give is the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. If you will please describe how an order to vacate and close the property at 123 West Millard Street will cause you irreparable harm or an undue hardship. Well, I, it's, a, it's a list of things, but the main thing is I've been diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's follicular lymphoma, which is basically a death sentence. There's no cure for it. And it accelerates over time and it can hyper accelerate. I grew two tumors in the left middle lobe of my lung in a matter of three months. Um, I'm not well. I've got lung issues and these ravage your internal organs. You have to remember and keep in mind that I've been at the Haven University for 20 years. 20 years. So I can, I got, when I hear Bill Willie talk about what he talked about, I can definitely sympathize with that. I'm right there and see it. Live it, drink it, and eat it. And, you know, I made it a point to go to a Christian facility. That's what the Haven of Mercy is. It's a Christian-based uh, homeless shelter. And they do it from that perspective. And for me, it worked. And uh, if I wasn't in, I wouldn't be here today if it didn't work. We're talking about, uh, you're not just going to uproot me. You're going to kill me. That's basically what it comes down to. You know, a person should have a right to live where they want to, but they should also have a right to die where they want to. <clears throat> so, they, you know, you, you can, I, I would ask you to really consider what you're doing, all of you. I mean, if it really comes down to a bunch of paperwork and whether or not we can live there when the repairs are being made and, and we're all stipulating like that, that's, that's sickening, pure and simple. Absolutely sickening. It, it's disgusting. I can't believe we do that to each other as human beings. I, I, you, I take this as uh, adversarial. I don't take it as you people wanting any, any real interest in making sure we go to anywhere that's nice and safe and can, uh, can accommodate us to the degree that each of us requires. They're all different and they're complex. You, I hope you realize that. You're talking about people that you're just not going to do that. It's not going to you can't, you can't uproot 75 people and, and just <laughs> in, a, in a ball. It's a can of worms. And unless you're ready, unless you want to put these people in the exact same environment with the exact same liberties they have now, then there's no point. I, I, I couldn't leave. I wouldn't leave. Thank you for your comments, uh, Mr. Kirsten. Um, do any board members have any questions? Mr. Kirsten, I, this is Gwen Hunter. I, I don't really have any questions, but I just feel compelled to express to you that um, we, we share a commonality in that I consider myself a follower of Christ also and am called to love everyone. And in the situation we're facing right now, the best way to show love is highly at the height of my, for in the front of my mind, because I think everyone deserves a safe place to live. And what I am being forced to decide and the rest of the members on this board is how we can best show our love for our, our fellow citizens here. It is not our desire to throw anyone out of their home. It's our desire to take actions that will provide a safe living environment. Um, if the Haven of Mercy can be uh, restored to a level of, um, of safety then I will be the first to applaud. I really want that to happen. I know it looks very adversarial. 
it feels that way to us too. We don't like to have to do this. We're looking for solutions and we want those solutions to happen before, you know, uh, an air conditioning unit falls out of the window and crushes somebody before, uh, you know, a, a potential fire would take place, um, anything like that. And that's, those are some of our concerns. So I, I just needed to, to express that to you. And I'm sorry for your your um, your health issues. I understand it's a, understandably an extremely difficult time for you. So thank you for coming forth and talking to us today. And well, listen, I appreciate what you said. I really do. But I'm in a safe environment. You know, this building suffered no more degradation than any other building in a 40 year span. Um, absolutely none. We've tried to keep up with it as best we could. I'm telling you, I'm living in a safe environment. Believe me, I'm concerned about me. <laughs> I know it sounds selfish in its own way, but I am. I'm on the, I told you, I'm, I, I'm looking at the very end. I'm safe there. I'm comfortable there. I need a miracle. I'm only going to get it on a hollow ground. That's just the way I feel. I've already received one when I first got there. I was a cocaine addict for years. So, and that's gone now. It just doesn't happen because I decided to quit. For some people that works. For me, it didn't. I needed something more. I had to seek it out. And lo and behold, four blocks from my home was a place called the Haven of Mercy. And one of the most compelling things that kept me there was this third night I was there. I was put on the third shift to watch the facility and take in potential residents, which I did. One evening, a gentleman came in and it was snowing. It was 20 degrees out. I got his index card because that's what we used at the time. We hadn't even had computers then. And one of the things I noticed was that he'd been there six times. So after getting him a bed, it made me curious. So I went to the index uh, card and I pulled most of them. And there were people there that had been there 12, 13, 14 times. And I thought to myself, what makes this place so special that people that are this sick would come back here that many times? And then it hit me. And then lo and behold, 20 years later, it worked for me. Thank you, Mr. Christian. I think that's what's, I think, most frustrating for all of us on the board is recognizing that the Haven of Mercy does good work. They That's do right. really good work. They save people's lives, but they are also endangering lives by not giving you all a safe place to lay your head at night. When you close your eyes at night and you go to sleep, you're not in a safe place. Ma'am, I live there. I can tell you you're wrong. You've never spent a night there. And and that's just not the truth. I get, you can look at it any way you want and color it the way you like to. That's your prerogative. I'm telling you, from my stance with a man who has cancer, a man is looking at the end, I'm telling you, I'm perfectly safe there. And I would be the first person to tell you I was unsafe if it was the truth, but it's simply not the truth. I'm safe, and I feel like the other guys are safe. And I think you got to ask each one of them personally. And, you know, I, well, that uh, was what this meeting was for, was to give everyone the opportunity to come and speak. Well, not everyone's here. Yes. <laughs> um, thank you very much. We appreciate very much you making the effort to come. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Mitchell, my question is, do we, cl and I apologize for not knowing this information already, do we close the public hearing before we begin to make a motion or do we? I, ha I, have, a, I have a question, uh, Ms. Lockmore, excuse me. Um, I, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. McLean another question, if that's appropriate. Sure. Sure. Um, Mr. McLean, uh, what organization do you represent? The Johnson City Housing Authority. Johnson City Housing Authority. Okay. Um, can you just share with us what, if any, services the Johnson City Housing Authority would be in a position to offer to people should they have to relocate? Uh, one option I provided to all the residents at Haven of Mercy is a Section 8 or a housing choice voucher. So that voucher will pay their rent and they'll, they'll only pay 30% of their income 
to rent an apartment here in town. And uh, so we, we made that offer to all the occupants there to come and get a voucher and they can relocate to another safe place that is passes inspections and would pass all the city code inspections as well. And, and so that offer has been made to all of them. Okay. And you would, would you, would uh, Johnson City Housing Authority be in a position to coordinate any other services that they might need? Uh, two of our witnesses here tonight have referenced needing, um, you know, services to help them maintain their sobriety. Um, Mr. Kirsten has referenced you know, <laughs> health issues. So are you in a position to provide other services, counseling, health, whatever? Wait, hold on one second. If, um, if Connect, I mean, not Johnson City Housing Authority provide the services, but help them connect with those services. Is that a service Johnson City Housing Authority? Right. I would, I, I would just encourage the board, if you're going to ask questions of Mr. McLean, um, just keep them general. Um, if you're going to make reference back to testimony that was given by the occupants, then we need to go ahead and swear in Mr. McLean. Um, but I would... Oh, okay. Just, well, okay, I can, it, it doesn't really, the, okay. Keep the questions general about what you're asking, um, Mr. McLean. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, no, so in general, I believe what I've heard you say is the Johnson City Housing Authority can assist uh, residents with uh, other housing options, is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Are there any other uh, services that housing authority could provide that might be helpful to people who are in um, <clears throat> challenging situations? Well, uh, I volunteer to take the position to coordinate among all the agencies for the uh, vacant vacancy of the building. And so I coordinated the O plan for the city to, to provide housing for everyone when the building was vacated earlier. And I coordinate resources with all the agencies here in town, Manor House, uh, Frontier Health, providing mental health services, uh, ETSU, uh, College of Medicine provided health care services. Uh, we connected with the Salvation Army as well. Uh, so, so we went out across the community here and identified all the resources available. We brought them together. We had multiple meetings and we prepared for when the building was emptied and we, we had a bed for everybody. And so we provided that service and coordinated those and that went very well. We assisted Mr. Rockley when he decided to empty the building on Thursday night before the 8 a.m. mandate to vacate the building. We, we assisted him that evening in finding housing for all the people. Uh, most of them landed at the manor house. And um, so that's, that's what we did. And, and I did that as a volunteer, basically, to provide that service and coordinate the resources. Because if we hadn't done it, I'm afraid that it would have been uh, chaotic and unsuccessful in providing everyone with a bed. So that's that's what I did. And, and the reason I do that is because I provide the housing functions for the city and we provide grants through the city to these agencies. So we work with them on a, on a daily, weekly basis of providing them funding and coordinating their projects and that sort of thing. And so we've been in that for many years. So through that relationship, we, we know all the agencies in town and what services they offer, and we provide funding for them to do those services. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that information. Do any other board members have questions? Uh, Madam Chair, a uh, couple things. Uh, first off, uh, Miss Miss Lee had unmuted a minute ago. Did you have a question? Uh, yes, um, I had. Uh, I wanted to note an objection for the record. Um, this board does not consider whether an air conditioning unit will fall out of a window. This is not before the board. Um, I'm not sure where that came from, other than maybe the um, fire code testimony from the January hearing. Um, so I'm objecting to the board considering an air conditioning falling out of the window. Thank you. That is noted. So, um, uh, Chairwoman Locke Miller, I I would also encourage the board to um, 
um, as as you know, the the evidence you received back on January 28th remains in full force and effect, as you stated in your opening comments, uh, Ms. Lockmiller. Um, and so since that evidence remains in effect, um, plus any evidence that you received tonight regarding um, uh, information that you've that you received from the architect or from um, from the residents, um, those are uh, pieces of evidence and information that you can use in making your findings um, to determine whatever it is that you're going to de determine tonight. I certainly understand the uh, the uh, amount and the depth of information that Mr. McLean gave is um, uh, helps paint a picture of the services that are available. Um, however, keep in mind that uh, you do need to be careful not to consider the services uh, that are available um, as part of the particular action that you're considering tonight. That is that is good information. Um, but you are specifically asking for evidence from the residents and from the architect. Yes, thank you. If, if oh, possible, okay. I'd like to ask an architect a question, if that's okay. Sure. Okay, uh, Mr. Gus Chow, good to see you. Uh, hey. Carl and I know each other from other projects, but um, um, there, there is something I'd like to, well, two things, that's a twofold kind of thing. Um, first, I'd like to clarify, uh, um, through your assistance, um, clarify with you the role of an inspector as it pertains to a building that's over 5,000 square feet. So inspectors, building inspectors, our inspectors in the building department, um, cannot go into a building without a set of plans and look at the things that are wrong and be very specific. Um, we can easily say this has not been done without permit. Um, some of the examples that were given previously that are on record at some point are things such as a date uh, on wiring um, that was recent. Um, we can go back in our records and say there hasn't been any permits pulled for this. Um, and then we, we said, you know, we need to get some permits for this work that's been done. So we can see that the authority uh, in buildings that are large enough um, come from architects and engineers. And basically what we do is we go in and say, you gotta go get an architect and engineer. This building's big, it's got lots of people in it. We don't have the authority to get into the nuts and bolts of what's wrong here, but we can say you need to go get some help. I kind of wanted to clarify that because there's been sp speak of us being vague, but the vagueness really comes from what we're allowed versus not allowed to do as far as a building is concerned. So when it comes to construction and construction matters, if it were a residence, we could go in and say, A, B, C, D, here's what's wrong. When it comes to a building, we don't have the authority to go into the nuts and bolts. We only have the authority to give big picture comments, such as this has been done without permit. Is that your experience with structures in Tennessee that are over 5,000 square feet that you need the design professional to make those decisions? You need, you need a set of accurate drawings and documents that you can make reference to so that when you do your inspections, you have the information in hand that points to this door, this window, this outlet. That, Absolutely. That would, be, that would be the way the process should work. It starts with a set of drawings, be it as built for an existing building or new drawings for a new building. You have to have that for a starting point, and this is why we have endeavored to start that process to create a set of as-built drawings of the Haven of Mercy, such that we can start that permitting process and be clear on what those items are and what needs to be repaired and how. That's wonderful. You and I are on the same page. I just wanted to clear that up. For, for, for folks that aren't in, in the construction business, it's, it's not readily known by the public and, that, and that's fine. I just wanted to make that clear. The second thing I had uh, that I wanted to state, now, we had we had the, the attorneys ask you some some different questions um, to get your expert opinion, and I want to do the same. I'm not a, I'm not an attorney, so is it okay? I ask both Preston and, and and the board. Is it okay if I ask him a question of his opinion? I'm not an attorney. There was a yes. I, I spoke with our city attorney. Uh -huh. If we had if we were able to ask questions of the architect, and Light she confirmed up. that we are indeed able to do so. Okay, great. It, it's a simple one. I just wanted to remove 
remove a lot of the, the situation and look at the building. Because that's that's what you and I do. That's what the board does. We're looking we're looking at this building. And if you were to have an R2 building, which is what this is, which means basically an apartment building, a place where people live. Um, if you have an R2 type occupancy, that's not sprinkled, very old building. Granted, it has plaster walls and things of that nature. Um, that has years of non-permitted electrical work um, that can be visually and generally noted by a cursory visual inspection. Um, would there be any inkling or potential to say that such a, such a structure that has not been checked through the proper processes of having design professionals and licensed contractors on board to execute and then inspectors to check the execution to keep it in line with the design professionals, all as Tennessee state construction law provides. Would it be, would there be potential to say that something that's gone unchecked with unpermitted electrical work only, well, I'm not even talking about mechanical because we can shut off the kitchen and say mechanical work doesn't matter. Let's just look at the electrical work. If there's been a lot of electrical work that's been done without permit or professionals in a building of with this square footage, now each one of these stories is almost 3,000 square feet, so we're well over 5,000 square feet, a three-story building plus a basement, <clears throat> a lot of the square footage. If electrical work has happened in a building like that, R2 occupancy, is there potential for hazard? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. That's all I wanted to clarify. It's, it seems simple enough to me. Um, I just wanted to get your opinion on that as well. That's all. That's all. The only question I had. Thank you, Mr. McClellan. Do and this is a Preston question, um, Mr. Mitchell. Sorry. Do we need to close the public hearing before we before a motion is made, or do we need to keep the public hearing open during the motion? No, you would need to close it before you make okay. findings and a motion. However, um, if you were just to go into a period of deliberation, you could leave the public hearing open during deliberation uh, in case there were any uh, questions of those members who testified. Okay. Um, Board, which would you prefer? Are you ready to move forward with a motion or would you like to keep the public hearing open to be able to ask additional questions? I'd rather, I'd sort of like to uh, hear the general thoughts of my fellow board members and any other comments or questions they might have. So I would like to keep the public hearing open. Okay. Anyone else have thoughts on that? Uh, Mr. Jenny, I believe you're trying to speak. You're muted. You're muted. Yes. Am I unmuted? You are unmuted. Okay. I, I would just like to make the comment to the gentleman that, that just testified. I understand how he feels with his lung problems. I have COPD. And... Um, Living in an environment of construction going on is going to do nothing but make his lung issues worse. It would make mine worse. Anyone's lung issues, that, that's going to happen in a construction environment. I, I, that's just what I'd like to say. And I would object. That's a medical opinion. No, it's my physical opinion. <laughs> I have COPD and I'm dying. He's dying. Period. And construction ain't good for it. Construction working it all my life is what caused this. Wow. I have another another question then for um, Mr. Gustraw. I'm sorry, I'm not pronouncing your name properly, I'm sure. Our architect. <laughs> um, I'm asking you to look into a crystal ball here probably, but you've already said that you anticipate it would take a, you know, a minimum of about two weeks to come up with as built drawings. Once you have those drawings, can you kind of give me an estimate of a timeline of what it would take to come up with drawings that would be necessary to 
bring this building up to code and then to actually end up with the, a repaired building. And I know that's a crystal ball kind of thing, but just some kind of a general idea of how much time would talk, we're talking about. Well, from what, where, where we're sitting right now and looking at the, draw, the building that we're working with and the plans that I have right now, for us to be have, have a set of plans that identify what the existing conditions plus the repairs and improvements, I'd say that's where I was saying it would probably take us about 30 days to be able to work through all of those issues. I'd have to defer to a contractor to be able to say how long it would take to make those repairs. And we'd have to allow the, the city a certain amount of time to review the plans for the permit. Is that not correct, David? Absolutely. Yeah, I would say that it would take, you know, um, turnaround is, is, is five, five business days for a first review and uh, three for any substantial after that. So uh, it, it, if it takes a month to get the drawings, it might take another two or three weeks afterwards. Um, to, they rarely come through perfectly the first time. There's usually some back and forth one or two times. So at that point, you might be looking about a month and a half and then you get contractors on board. Um, and then how long their execution uh, is uh, depends upon the, the termination that's, that's brought about in the drawings. So the drawings might say, no, you know, it's only the small stuff and it's very easy to fix, or it could be you have to completely rewire the building, which would take much longer. So it depends upon the scope of work that's determined as to how long the contractor might take. But it's a month and a half on top of whatever the contractor might need, at, at minimum, I'd say. Okay. Mr. Gutcho, I have a question. When did you um, when did you enter into a contract with Haven of Mercy to begin doing these drawings? Well, I'm trying to recall, to be honest with you, but I know it's around February 25th, as you stated in the in the entry. Okay. So it was not October, November, December, January. Oh, no. Of 2020. Oh, no. No, no, or 2020. No. Okay. No, no. Okay. Any board uh, members? Have any further questions? Would you like to open or close the public hearing? Or sorry, close the public hearing? Or would you like to keep it open? Is anyone interested in making a motion? Chairman Lockmiller, Chairwoman Lockmiller, before you close the public hearing, I'd like to make a closing. Okay, as long as it's specifically related to um, how the residents will be irreparably harmed. Uh, the, the previous orders were made and are in good standing, so we don't want to relitigate those as long as it's related to the irreparable harm. Um, you have seen tonight that there are deficiencies in this process of how not only the owner but the occupants were given notice. Um, failures to provide the magic language that we talked about that are required by due process. That's part of the municipal code, the state law and the, the US constitution. You heard about our official hardship appeal from not only the owner, but also the occupant. You heard testimony tonight from three residents about the irreparable harm that they will experience if you vacate and close this residence. You heard testimony from the architect that the building can remain open during the repair of each of the cited deficiencies. Actually, Ms. Lee, he said exactly the opposite. He said he could not make a comment about that. He said until the drawings were completely done, he could not state that with certainty. 
Okay, I don't, I don't mean to argue with you. He did answer each of my questions about each of the, the citations. He testified that residents can stay in the building while electrical panels are checked, while permits are pulled and electrical panel is reviewed. That residents can stay in the building while the electrical is repaired. He also testified that residents can stay in the building while a ventilation hood is repaired or installed. He also he did he did state that, but I would also like to point out he also did not state that he also stated that until his drawings are complete, he cannot make that assurance. He, he, also, he so I. I would encourage the board just to let her finish. And then if, if, if you believe there are some inaccuracies, uh, address them at that time. Um, okay, thank yeah. you. He also testified that extension cords can be removed while the residents stay in the facility. Those are the issues that are before this board. I differ from Chairwoman Lockmiller's position that this government board, that this city board does not have to consider whether it's the least restrictive means to meet the compelling government interest. It's a requirement that this board consider the least restrictive means to affect these residents and the owner. I am also would like to point out that the issues that we've, we've discussed with the board tonight about what is before this board, I hope that you consider that. Um, you heard a lot of evidence and most relevant, but some that was not in prior hearings. It would be an error to consider the best practices in the fire code. It would be an error to consider whether an air conditioning unit is properly secure. Those are not things before this board tonight and they weren't before the board in January. I hope that this board will consider that vacating and closing the structure will be an incredible hardship on the owner the ministry and the occupants. And we ask you tonight to take the least restrictive means and that least restrictive means would be allowing the repairs to occur while the residents stay in the facility and the ministry continues to operate. And that is the testimony that our witness, Mr. Carl Cutshaw gave you tonight. Now, Ms. Lockmiller was concerned at the beginning of my closing that he said something different. Well, that was a different question. And he said that, and I'm paraphrasing, that there may be additional problems once he can, completes his work. But as of right now, electrical can be repaired while residents stay in the building. The hood can be installed while residents stay in the building. The panel can be reviewed and permits pulled while residents stay in the building and electrical cords can, or extension cords can be removed while residents stay in the building. So that's what we're asking the board to do tonight. Thank you. Mr. Gutshaw, um, we've heard testimony from the building department throughout these hearings that there was unpermitted work that was done inside the Haven of Mercy. That falls under the scope of permits being required for the particular items that were listed in the exhibit A. Have you been able to analyze and evaluate all of that unpermitted work and assure that it was done safely and doesn't uh, uh, propose imminent danger? I have had, I have not had that opportunity, no. I have a question of, of uh, city staff. Um, no, I think I'll hold this until we close the public hearing. Thank you. That was I was actually would, about to do I would, that. <laughs> I would request 30 seconds to speak to the irreparable 
a harm issue. Okay. All right, thank you. Setting a timer. <laughs> uh, so the board's letting stand everything that's previously taken place. We went to chancery court based off of what had previously taken place. We alleged six violations, one of those by one, six, six complaints. One of those complaints had five subcategories. The boards picked up one, occupants to the notice, but all of those other claims were violations of, sub, of procedural and substantive rights that as Ms. Lee said, range from local ordinance state statutes to the state and federal constitution. A violation of those rights under the law is irreparable harm defined as something that cannot be accounted for money damages. And that's something that it, at least the witness I was I cross-examined uh, confirmed that in their mind, violating their rights during this process would cause them irreparable damage. Thank you. I, I do have a, a question, one more question of either um, of, of the owner or the owner's representative. Um, how, many, how many people are currently um, living in the residence or how many people, I mean, come in, people I know sometimes come and go, but um, I believe I understood that the, um, no more residents were, were being admitted after February 10th. First of all, is that accurate, accurate information that I have? Uh, Ms. Hunter, it is. The Haven can house up to 70 individuals. Um, the chancellor gave an order stating that the one notice that, that had been provided uh, based on a February notice, um, that no additional residents could come into the Haven at that time. However, that lawsuit has been dismissed at this time. We provided um, at, at, at that hearing, um, the court uh, wanted to know if the occupants had received notice. And okay. the city's attorney, you know, said that that no, essentially they hadn't been my, provided. Uh, Miss Lee, my, my basic question is, I'm I'm just curious about how many people approximately are currently living in the facility. Thirty-five. 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 Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I hope that helps. I have a question for city staff. What is the current? legal occupancy what is the i know i own a business and we have a legal occupancy of a certain number for uh, my business what is the legal occupancy of the haven of mercy it's it's honestly um uh, undetermined without a um new occupant load to be determined we don't know um, we have we have old drawings. Of, well, I'll tell you the way occupancies are typically determined in places of assembly, like your business, Jenny, mm -hmm. um, uh, as a standard. Every right. place of assembly has to have an occupant load count posted. Right. Um, however, residential facilities don't need that unless they have a place of assembly, which which might be true for the dining hall. Um, and I, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, uh, I think there were. Uh, I think we might have some documentation on the dining hall, um, and I, I, I can't I can't tell you off the hip. Um, should should this property have a, an occupancy a maximum load? Occupant loads are determined basically for exiting and egress, um, and for the general layout of the building. This building is a hundred years old. Right. Um, they just didn't do that then, and we don't have that documentation. It can be redetermined. Uh, Mr. Gutschow will determine that in his drawings. Okay. That is going to be a part of his drawing set. But currently, we don't have a firm number. Uh, to so at this that. point, we don't know if 35 is a legal number or a not legal number. We don't know if 70 is a legal number or a not legal number. We don't know if they have actually the space to house 70 or 35 or another number. Is that correct? I would guess that 35 would be okay due to square footage. Um, however, I couldn't speak to 70 without without uh, more details or, or looking at it more closely. Okay. I would note in a, I would note an objection to Mr. Clellan, Mr. McClellan's statements. Having reviewed the prior hearings in this matter uh, regarding the 123 West Millard Street, <laughs> the board's already accepted as a factual matter previously. Uh, that 70 to around 80 occupants is uh, what it about where it's at. And the board is 
evidently standing on those past facts, but now we're we're refining those. So I would I would object to that. You know, my only reason for asking the question was that I was trying to determine how many souls are potentially at risk. Well, we did do an estimate based on old fire alarm drawings at one point because we didn't know how many were in there, and we, and we did a guesstimate, which Mr. Muse uh, is referencing. So, so that was a general guesstimate based on square footages of information that we had available. Okay, Thank and you. I, I know I've seen multiple numbers ranging from sixty to up to eighty, and now we're hearing thirty-five. So, I've heard multiple numbers related to that. <clears throat> Okay, at this point, we are going to close the public Chairwoman, hearing. Chairwoman Lock Miller to respond to, there was a question about how many people were currently residing at the Haven. Yes. And that's why we provided the number of 35. Yes. That is, is currently. However, uh, based on what Mr. McClellan is stating, there's previous fire code uh, allowance for 70, around 70. And that's what we're referencing. We're not changing the numbers on you. Okay, thank you very much. I think at this point, we're going to go ahead and close the public hearing. And the board, uh, we will open it up for the board to make a motion or have a, dis I guess we have to make a motion to have any discussion at all, so. So Chairwoman, uh, before you all continue with your deliberation, if I could, I just wanted to uh, ask that one clarification be made for the record. And it was based on um, Ms. Lee's uh, PowerPoint presentation. At the very beginning, she indicated that she had emailed the Director of Development Services. And I just wanted to clarify that I had not received an email from you, Amber. I wonder if you're making reference to the email that you emailed Mr. McClellan and Mr. Ryder on um, looks like here, February 25th at 1248 p.m. Um, now in, in the response, Mr. McClellan copied me as the director of development services, uh, but Mr. McClellan is the development services manager. So just wanted to provide that clarification. I emailed Mr. Ryder and Mr. McClellan. And so I inadvertently called him the director instead of the development services director instead of the development services manager. Thank you. Okay. So the public hearing is closed. Now it's up to the board. So here's, it's all hard, but here's, so, here's the hard part is um, before you rush to make a motion, uh, maybe I should say that more carefully, not rush, before you just jump and make a motion, consider the making findings. You, you it, it is important that you um, make certain findings based on the information, not only as, as, as previously noted, not only based on the information you received back on January 28th, um, but also based on the information that you, you received tonight. Now I've taken copious notes and I'm I'm certain that you all have, have as well. Um, so I would encourage you uh, to, and don't worry about time. Don't worry about, um, don't, don't worry about feeling like you've got to make it perfect or that it's got to sound perfect. Um, but the important thing is that you begin making some findings and how you begin to make those findings um, uh, which ex examples of which were found in your last order. Now, again, I will, I will uh, concur with the statement made by Ms. Lee that, um, that the last order uh, that was made, there was an injunction filed, uh, the order was rescinded, so that order is no longer valid, and then the uh, lawsuit was, uh, was uh, removed. Um, however, what I'm trying to borrow from is, is how those findings came about. And so you had several people appear before you tonight. So it would be important for you to note who appeared before you tonight and go back to your notes and make some statements about what were some of the things they said about those people who appeared before you tonight. And then in addition, 
if there was other pieces of evidence that you received tonight that uh, would be in addition to what you received on the 28th. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you very much. So um, we heard from three residents of uh, the Haven of Mercy. Are we required to make a determination as to whether we believe that they will be irreparably harmed or? So here's the, here's the funny thing about quasi-judicial is that if you note in the very beginning of the meeting, when you read your opening statements, one of the things you read is that this is, I don't think you use the word quasi-judicial, but this is a hearing um, that is not bound to the, and I'm not going to get the exact language right, but it, it's not bound to the, to the exact rules, uh, to um, uh, judicial rules that Ms. Lee or Mr. Muse might follow in a courtroom. Um, so, but quasi-judicial -ju means that you still need to receive sworn testimony. You still need to consider objective evidence, meaning do your best to avoid opinions. Um, however, it's up to the board, the group of you, you're really acting as the judge. It's up to you all as a group. And that's important because I encourage uh, Jonna and, 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 and Dave and, and, and everyone, Jenny, Jennifer, to step into this conversation and as a board, decide the information you believed, whether or not um, you determined that information to be factual. Um, and so uh, it, is, it, is, it is the board's call, uh, so to speak, to decide what information um, they will receive and that they will make a finding off of. Okay, I'll just start. For me, the biggest concern is that um, based on the fact that um, the proper permits have not been pulled at this point because they cannot be pulled because they are still waiting on drawings to be completed, that we are still, uh, the condition of the property is the same as it was in October for us because permits have not been pulled and we have no verification um, because the proper permits were not pulled there's no mechanism for city staff to go in and, and verify that the work that was done was actually done correctly. Um, I certainly hope that the people that the Haven of Mercy is ha have hired uh, to do this work have done it up to city code. But at this point, we have absolutely no way of verifying that because the proper permits were not pulled and the inspection process was not triggered. So that's sort of where we're sort of stuck right now. I share that concern. It bothers me greatly that it, there was conversation. We, we've had some findings um, in October and then went by November, December, uh, January, uh, an architect, a professional services architect engineer were not even engaged until late February. Um, that concerns me greatly, not because of the details of the paperwork, but because those findings are to keep people safe. And that shows a lack of action on the part of the owner to provide for the safety. And this board is not responsible for anything above you know, minimum housing standards. That's it, minimum housing standards. And we saw evidence in October that those minimum housing standards were not met. And I've been shown nothing, unfortunately, to show me that anything has changed for those people. And we heard from three people tonight who deserve a safe place to live. Um, 
and that's that's what has to be my focus and i'm i'm very concerned about those people i'd really appreciate hearing from any of my fellow board members that might have anything to say because i feel like we got to make this decision as a team i would agree with you uh, miss hunter in that um the concern is that I'd like to think that all the tradespeople that were hired to do the work have done work that is up to code for the city of Johnson City, but I'm also very, very concerned that the tradespeople that were hired didn't pull the proper permits. They pulled residential permits instead of commercial permits, and that gives me great concern for whether they are they made the right decision in pulling the proper permit. And so then that gives me concerns about whether they um, have done the work appropriately because it was done to a residential standard rather than a commercial standard. Any other board members have anything they wanna share? Help us out here, <laughs> let us in on your thought process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Would any board member like to make a motion to at least open some discussion about a, a motion? Okay, for the... So oh, would we... Go so ahead. with the architecture person, the guy that needs to tell us more information of what he's got to do, when he's going to do it, and how long it's going to take, how are we going to take that into consideration? The time of when it's going to get done and what it, <coughs> the requirements for that. If if he comes back and tells us it's going to take six months, that's, I mean, I, I, I'd like to have a time of, I'd like to talk to him when he finds out the evidence and then we'll go from there to see what, how long it's going to take. And if it's going to take longer than housing the, the, the people until that's taken care of, housing them somewhere else, if it's, if it requires them leaving. But I, I think for me, the concern is the evidence that we have, and we've already found this property to be, property to be unfit for human habitation. So the fact that an architect was not engaged until February 25th, mm -hmm. um, it, honestly, to me, it shows such a lack of concern for the residents by the owner. I'm, I'm just so, I'm so bothered by the fact that we as a board are more concerned about the safety of these residents than the owner is. I think that is the part that is hardest for me. My reason for asking about a timeline mm -hmm. was that we know this building has been, appears to have been unsafe for quite some time based on the evidence that we have been presented with. So I think I was hoping to hear by some miracle that the building could re be repaired within just a few months. Right. That for me minimizes the risk just because of the time. Every day that goes by is another day that every occupant of that building is at risk. So if I was able to hear that it could be repaired quickly and mm -hmm. properly, that would influence what action I felt. Need right. To take. right. But I, I, I haven't heard anything that lead me to believe that it's going to be. I mean, anything short, anything short of months, mm -hmm. many months. At this uh, point, the 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 architect has said it will be thirty days before he's even ready to make an assessment as to the safety of the building. Right. Based on his drawings. Right. And then it goes to the city staff and yes. city staff, of course, has to review that. And that testimony has shown 
that that would be approximately, I mean, no less than five days, if I heard correctly, then it will go back to the architect for, uh, for additional changes, then it will come back and even, you know, it, this, so this process just might take a while just because that's the process. It takes a while to get it all lined up and then it goes out to contractors and we probably most, most all know contractors are really busy these days. It's always busy. We've heard time and time again how long it takes. So therefore I'm very concerned because what I saw in the evidence shows me that there are multiple infractions. It's not just electrical. There are other concerns that, that we were, were shown in the evidence. Right, and we've also heard testimony from um, uh, representatives of the Haven of Mercy that these that they have hired people to make these repairs. But again, because the proper permits were not pulled, we cannot. We can only believe what has been not believe. We can only uh, trust what has been inspected. So I can tell you that it's safe, but until an inspector actually shows up and says it's safe, we can't, we can't base a, a finding on that. Right, and that's no disrespect to those tradespeople. It's just that that's what we're charged to do as a board. Chairwoman Log Miller, um, y'all are doing a great job. You're, 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 you're having the kind of conversation that you need to be having. I, I, I would, I would, I pose something to you, um, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Gotcho Gotchow. I am so sorry if I'm uh, uh, brutalizing that. Um, uh, has has done a fantastic job tonight with his uh, with his testimony, um, and uh, provided detail where he's been able to. Uh, and, or I should say specifics where he's been able to. Um, one thing that he did testify to was that he believes that he could have as built within two weeks. Well, within, in two weeks from tonight is your normal regular March meeting. So because of this, because of where you are right now in this conversation um, and the testimony that you've heard tonight, uh, something you could consider is, um, is, uh, not reopening the public hearing, but asking specifically, kind of like you did in January when you specifically asked for the property owner to come back on February 25th and provide an update right, as right. to the work. Um, but uh, to ask that the architect come back on the 25th, um, having testified that as builds could be provided in two weeks. And having as built is going to have a whole lot more information than where we are tonight. It's not at the plan set yet, it's not at the permit set yet, but those as builds will at least identify um, what's in the building, what's there now. So I just tossed that out that tonight is a special called meeting. You still have your regular meeting on the 25th. Thank you. That was incredibly helpful. Based on that information provided by city staff, I'm gonna make a motion that we continue the property at 123 West Millard Street until our next regularly scheduled meeting on April. No, April March. 20th, no, March. Well, March 20, I mean, our March 25th meeting, excuse me, and request that um, the architect, the, the own, an owner's rep, the architect be present to, um, as well as the owner and the owner's owner to be present to share with us the uh, update on the drawings. I second that. Any discussion? Before you vote, I would just clarify um, specifically asking for the as built on the 25th. Thank you. I would like to have the as built drawings presented to us at the meeting on March 25th, 2021. Do we need to check with Mr. Gushaw and see if that's even possible? Or Sure, you can ask him that. Yes, Mr. Gushell, is that possible? <laughs> we will do our best. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, I would like to add, as part of the discussion, I am incredibly concerned about 
we have found this property unfit for human habitation and we are allowing now for more than 30 days for um, people to live in this property in what we consider an unsafe condition. And that is, that is a big concern of mine. Um, I just would like to add that. <laughs> is of mine, of mine too. I, I, I think we all agree on that. Is there any way, so I know that um, we don't have any authority to, to not allow additional people to move into the property, do we? I, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm unmuted. I would need to rely on uh, Miss Lee uh, with, uh, or Mr. Muse with Ms. Sandoz not on the on the call right now regarding uh, Chancellor Rambo's statement. Um, if that if that um, if if the restriction on no more after the tenth was specifically applicable to that injunction. Um, it was specifically applicable to the temporary restraining order. And, um, but I will state that more residents have not moved in. It is still the same 35. And I would just like to ask um, as a matter of, um, you know, in the spirit of any compromises that we can work out with each other to, to the benefit of those residents, I would just like to request that the owner, um, you know, err on the side of safety and not allow any more people to come in there. Just causes more challenges for everybody. I, I would agree with that as well. Simply because we don't have an, a maximum occupancy for the building right now. So it's not an official request of the board because, of, as I doubt that we have that authority. Just a simple human request. I agree. I don't think we have the authority either. But just in a, I agree with Ms. Hunter in that a, it's in a request in the way of, we all have to lay our heads on our pillows and sleep at night <laughs> and live with what we did the day before. Um, so my, I agree with Ms. Hunter that the request is done just in the matter of doing the best you can with what you have. Okay, so we have, is there any other discussion? We have a motion on the table to continue the property to the March 25th, 2021 Board of Dwelling Standards meeting. There will not be a public hearing at that point. There will simply be a um, report from, we would like to ask that Mr. Uh, Gutschall uh, or his representative provide us with information and specifically what information are we asking for Ms. Hunter? I'm asking for as-built drawings. Okay, the as-built drawings. Will those have the information that would, would um, will that just have, I guess where I'm asking, this may be a city staff question. Will that provide us with the information we need to know whether, um, what the estimated timeline for repair would be and what the repairs would need to be? Or is that just I'm, I'm glad walls you and, and that's, stairs? That's exactly why I unmuted. Um, so I'm glad you asked. I would anticipate um, that it will show you basically what's there. And as built simply documents what's present. Um, I would not anticipate, and, and, and I mean, it, it's, it's possible, but I would not anticipate, it's not typical um, to have uh, as-builts of the, of the building systems uh, first off. It's typically architectural, walls, doors, windows, um, the, the space you're working with. Um, and some of the biggest questions that we have really wrap around the systems, I would imagine the as-builts are created and then they're passed to the engineers. The engineers will come through and they will kind of do their own assessment at that point. Um, the engineers will then say, these are the things that are wrong. This is, this is what needs to be done. I would not anticipate with the as-builts in two weeks, we will have any other information other than 
the as built are done, we're ready to pass them to the engineers. And uh, Mr. Mr. Gus Chow, please correct me if I'm wrong, or if you anticipate anything different. You, you expressed it correctly, what the as-builts begin to show or would show is what the existing layout or floor plan, I think is one is the term that most people can relate to. But at the same time, we are simultaneously going to begin collecting that data because while we're on site, we'll be, be collecting the location of outlets, the location of smoke detectors, fire alarm pulls, and we will be formulating and placing those that information on the document. So it is basically a simultaneous process. Will we have a definitive answer on all of the issues on the 20 on March 25th? No, but we will have a set of documents that we can begin to use to identify what those improvements need to be. That will be very helpful. Based on those as built documents, Mr. Gutschel, would you be able to then um, identify work that needs to be completed and provide an opinion, an expert opinion as to whether the work can be completed while there's occupants in the building? Would, will that information, will those as-built documents give you that information? I won't really know the answer to that until I get to the 25th. Okay, thank you. Board, is there any other discussion? I have to say, I, I'm again, if we keep kicking this can down the road every two weeks or 30 days, it is unsafe. We have found it unsafe and unfit. Well, I, um, yes, Ms. Under. Um, for me, if my concern is, um, I agree with you, it's still unsafe. Mm -hmm. My concern is if we order a vacating clothes, we'll just go back through the same legal cycle that we've been on. And I, I'm motivated to try to come to a solution mm -hmm. that is going to incentivize the owner to make the repairs. Yes. We have made it abundantly clear here that it is our position that mm -hmm. everyone who occupies that building is putting their life at risk. Mm -hmm. I have to recognize that there are adults making their own decisions in this situation. If they are choosing to put their lives at risk, which we think they are. They may differ from that. They have a different opinion. They're adults. They have a right to their own opinions. I'm willing to turn the responsibility for their safety over into their individual hands, uh, recognizing that I believe the owner of that property has a great moral and ethical responsibility as well as legal responsibility to provide a safe environment. So if we vote to continue this property until the March 25th meeting, I certainly hope that we are shown something that will give us a reason to think that this property is gonna get fixed in a reasonably quick way or if we're shown something that we further think there's a concern, uh, then we can make that decision at that time. I agree. Okay, I think it's our only option. Um, 
before you make any decisions or or content or, or call for the question um let me ask the board a question and dave if you're still there um uh and mr uh Gutshow, is it possible and and dave first of all i i i really appreciate your clarification on the as builds and and in that those because I'm so accustomed to civil as built and the architectural as built being limited to just the structure itself um, and that the systems uh, might be an add on. So um, the uh, uh, Mr. Gutsho, if 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 and when on the March 25th, if you were to come and provide testimony as to the, the current state of affairs with the building, not only in terms of the building, but in terms of the building systems, um, to the best of your ability, would you be speaking on behalf of those other entities or, uh, or, so I guess now I'm turning my head to Dave. Dave, is it best um, that representatives of those systems um, be on the call uh, or is that strictly and solely handled by the architect? Uh, the, the architect drives the ship, um, so I mean, if he if he has a general opinion of, I, I'd say <clears throat> I, I didn't anticipate them to uh, include in their as builts much as in way of the systems. Um, they have they definitely have the ability to look at the systems and say, this doesn't look right. This this feels a little bit off. Uh, I'm not so sure about this. Um, they might not be able to design a full system complete with details. Um, or maybe not, they, they, they do, but they might not feel, excuse me, comfortable doing that. Um, I would take into very serious consideration their their opinion um, of what they might see during the, taking those as built. So I think if he were to come back and say, everything looks fine, <laughs> you know, then, then you know, that we could substantiate that later and, and feel good about it. But um, if he said, I'm not so sure, we do need to get engineers and, and et cetera in here. Um, that, 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 that has a lot of value to it. Um, um, so I, I, I didn't consider them go to that level uh, of detail with the as-built, but um, I think anything that they can determine would absolutely have great value, not having to bring in the uh, uh, engineers if they didn't feel it was uh, uh, needed at that time. Sure. Thank you. Am I still on here? You are, Mr. Jenny. I'd like to apologize for what I said. Um, but my biggest concern here of what we have seen so far and what we've been told so far, having a mechanical background going back 40 years, is the cooking in the facility. To me, that is probably the most dangerous thing we've got in there right at the moment. And I feel that that should cease if we continue to occupy the place. So for clarification's sake, um, and Dave, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, as it was stated on January 28th, the kitchen was closed by administrative order of uh, Dave McClellan the interim chief building official and the development services manager back in, I believe it was October. And he has that authority under the municipal code. So the kitchen was closed back in the fall and should still be closed to this day. Is so that it, it was closed from what I understand, but pictures we have seen of it since then, they have done modifications that do not meet any kind of code at all. And is, so I, I would just like to be sure that it's still closed. Is that a question we can ask? Is the kitchen currently in use, Mr. Mitchell? Sure. No, we've closed the public hearing. You can ask that of the property owner uh, or of his, uh, of his uh, legal counsel. Okay, so that's the question of the property owner or his legal counsel. Is the kitchen currently in use? It is not. 
for any purpose. What, what does that mean? Serving of food. <laughs> okay. There, there is cold, uh, uncooked food being served at the Haven. Okay. There is no heated food at all. No microwaves, no ovens, none of that is being used. I do not know, uh, have information if a microwave is being used, but no ovens. Um, Mr. McClellan, I guess, is the person I need to ask this of. Are microwaves allowed? Are any Is any heating of food allowed under the current order? Well, we, in my mind, the closing of the kitchen was cooking, which involved heating in any capacity. It was primarily of cooktop, oven, um, microwave is borderline. That would be more, <clears throat> excuse me, electrical based. Um, None of it was none of it was adequate. Um, so so ideally it would be none. But the the order we gave was to for the kitchen to be closed is what we said, which would mean zero food in any capacity, was, was the way it was stated. Um, but I wouldn't be opposed to you know cold food. That's there's there's no there's no repercussion. The, the heating, the gas, the venting, those were the main concerns. Okay, so we have a motion to continue the property to the March 25th meeting. Is there any more discussion from the board? Before, before you call the question, um, just, uh, just to make sure, and I'm, and I'm only asking this just out of, out of being careful, and, and uh, is um, I know you have provided for the, the clarific or the request that the architect provide as built and it, and I would ask that you clarify um, the as built based on the conversation you heard between Mr. McClellan and uh, Mr. Gutshow um, that the as built uh, include as Mr. Gutshow stated um, as much information as he can possibly glean uh, in that two week period. Um, the other is I would also suggest that uh, just to be safe that all uh, all evidence and information that has been carried over from January 28th continue to be carried over till March 25th. Okay. Do we need to add that to the motion? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Hunter, would you like to amend your motion too? <laughs> okay. um, yes, I'd like to amend my motion to request that at the March 25th 2021 meeting, the as-built drawings include as much information about uh, the, the physical property at 123 West Millard Street as an architect could reasonably be expected to provide. Um, and that all, all motions from the- All, all the, evidence. All, all evidence from the January 28th meeting um, be continued to that uh, March meeting as well. We consider, consider, continue to consider that evidence. Is that adequate, Ms. Mr. Mitchell? It is, in addition to the evidence received tonight. Thank you, in addition to the evidence received tonight. Mm -hmm. Is there any more discussion from the board? There's no more discussion. I'll call for the question. If I may clarify, did Ms. Robbins second the motion? I did. Okay, thank you. All right, Ms. Hyder. Recuse. Mr. Jenny. Yes. Ms. Robbins. Yes. Ms. Hunter. Yes. And Ms. Lockmiller. No. Motion approved as stated. Okay, that was our only agenda item. So since I don't have a gavel, <laughs> unless there's any other uh, 
business that needs to be brought. Was there any older new? No other business. Okay. So uh, if there's no other business, the meeting is adjourned at 8.18 p.m. Thank you all.